Hi, welcome back to the Emotional Resilience Video Toolbox. My name is Lisa Lofman, and I'm an emotional wellness consultant here at Michigan State University's Health for You program. We're in the process of offering our first video series, which is on acceptance and commitment therapy. And the, the, the purpose of the model, acceptance commitment theory, sometimes called ACT, is to help you increase your psychological flexibility. Um, too often, people, um, you know, feel like they're only going to be okay emotionally if everything's just exactly kind of how they think they need it to be. And what we know we need in business uh, settings and life settings is the ability to be more adaptive because things often don't go as we planned. And um, when something changes, the quicker we are able to get to our most creative, resilient self, the better things turn out to be. I think that's true in 100% of situations, really, when you think about it. So in the process of our first series, uh, this is the sixth video. It's going to focus on the skill of expansion. Um, as we've talked about in past episodes, uh, um, I'm going to move this out of the way for a second here. Um, this, this model here is a, a way for us to measure kind of where we're currently at and where we'd like to go and become more flexible. Um, so the first video was an overview of, uh, of the worksheet and asked you to fill that out. And then in the second video, we talked about the self as observer. And then in the third and fourth videos, we talked about diffusion. And in the uh, fifth video, we talked about being able to help yourself come back to the present moment, recognizing that a lot of time when we're in an upset, we're either in the future or in the past. I'm shopping in those thought stores and we're not actually uh, in the present moment. Uh, psychological flexibility can be summed up by saying that we want to be um, in the present moment. Uh, we want to be able to be in the present moment, open up and do what matters. Um, psychological flexibility, the model is very value guided and driven. And um, that's what we want to do. Uh, when something happens, we want to be able to get to our deepest, wisest self reflect on what our values want us to do and to be able to do that more often. Um, so coming back to the present moment kind of helps clear away the experience you've already created so that the next experience that you have with something can be more value guided. Um, and so today, well, first off, when, we, when, uh, when you take your scores, uh, you're probably initially gonna be closer to the center of that, of that diagram, remembering that we think of that as a cross section of a hose and if our psychological hose is open, then our creativity, our grace, our common sense, our wisdom, our humanity can flow more easily. When we're constricted and tight, um, kinked up, if you will, it's harder for that good energy to flow through, it can lead to disconnection or depression or stress. Um, and we're just noticing and releasing the kink. Uh, I said in one of the earlier videos that if you were to draw a line right here, these four are really about noticing and releasing the kink. And these two over here are really, what do I want to water and how committed am I to the watering process? Like how, how much am I lining up with that on a day-to-day -day basis? So we're wanting to move these numbers out. And um, each of the videos is designed to help you move that particular skill out and to develop some strategies for noticing and inter interrupting some habits. Um, so the, the video that we're talking about today really focuses on this skill here. Uh, here it's labeled acceptance, uh, the acceptance scale, but it's also sometimes referred to as expansion. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Before we go forward, you know me, I'd like to sort of, sort of check in with you. If you were in my class, I'd wanna check in and look in, into your faces and see how, how you're doing with things. Um, so my question for you is what are you noticing um, and what happens when you notice? Uh, and when you notice, are you gently self-correcting or are you um, beating yourself up? Most of us are pretty harsh with ourselves. So my questions about what are you noticing are, are, are you noticing when you start to get go from calm and open and relaxed to more rigid and constricted and upset? Um, are you noticing that with your thought world getting busy? Are you noticing that with your physical body tightening up? Like, are you getting any better at noticing when you go from relaxed and open and at ease to reactive? Um, just this morning, I was talking with my partner about something, and it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. We both agree it's, the thing is a challenge. 
um, and I have to figure out what I'm going to do about something, and it's hard. And so there's moments when I get really constricted about it, and I and I uh, I might in that moment uh, get defensive or feel pressured, um, not be able to sort out what I want to do. So it was so helpful this morning when I noticed it, and when I noticed it, and she noticed it, to be able to call attention to it in a way that I don't have to feel guilty about it. I just want to notice that I'm having a reaction and likely not at my best self, at which point that opening up happened again and I could get clear about what I wanted to do about it. So the noticing is really critical to having your next behavior be more lined up with yourself. There's nothing that we're teaching here that's going to prevent you from getting kinked up. It's just we're hoping that you'll notice more often and be able to come back to your wisest, most grounded, centered self before you say the next thing or do the next thing. So are you noticing that, that you get reactive sometimes? We all do. Uh, are you noticing that um, you are resisting something that you agreed to or resisting something that just is and that your resistance isn't helping you very much, that your resisting that is happening is actually a block to something different happening? Are you noticing that? Are you noticing that you have rules about things that you didn't notice that you had rules about and that your tight allegiance to those rules, um, particularly when the situation doesn't fit the rules, uh, that your, that your um, adherence to those rules are actually not helpful. If you're noticing all that stuff, yay, I'm going to throw points to you for noticing. That's a good thing. And it just proves that you're, that you're fully human uh, and that you're operating perfectly and that you want to be able to notice uh, more. So it's the notice and gently self-correct. I also want you to notice if you are criticizing and judging and blaming yourself because it's really not very useful. I actually call that the double whammy when we're, you know, we notice ourselves have a, you know, a shame reaction or um, a judgmental reaction. And then we notice that and we start to open up. And then another thought comes through that says you shouldn't be like that. And then we get into a shame store. That's equally not helpful to you being the goal, remember, is to be in the present moment, open up, and do what matters. Judging yourself because you just did something wrong a minute ago isn't going to help you get back to that space more quickly. And that's kind of what we're really wanting to do is to live in that space more often, you know, when we are not in that space to notice and come home sooner. I used to live in an upset and occasionally visit my wisdom. And now I really believe, and I believe the vast majority of people who know me would agree, that I live in my wisdom and I visit upset. And I notice when I'm there and I come home more quickly. And that's the kind of rhythm that we want. I will probably leave the planet having recently <laughs> gotten caught up. I'm never going to be able to make that not happen. But the impact can be lowered and the amount of time I spend in that and how much I get fooled by that can can decrease. So what are you noticing and what happens when you notice? And what we really are looking for is for you to notice and gently self-correct. If you if your values say you want to be uh, a calm, clear parent and you just lost your ever loving mind uh, in, in conversation with your kid, you want to be kind to yourself, come back to your values and simply begin again. And that's just the rhythm uh, that we're looking for. So uh, the relax, reflect, resolve tagline that we talk about so much here, uh, th this conversation is really about the reflecting part. You know, when you've noticed and you've come back, you know, you notice that you're constricted with some thoughts or feelings, you're starting to come back to your deepest, wisest self, and then you're going to be reflecting on and making space for what you're experiencing. So we'll talk about how that fits today. Um, today's skill is called expansion, which I think of as just making space, really expanding your moment so that you can make space for the experience that you're having, both the thought that you're having and sometimes the emotion that you're having. Another way to think about this skill is acceptance, which is really kind of like allowing yourself to feel what it is you're feeling. I mean, really, that's as simple as it gets today, folks, that we want to in the moment, allow ourselves to feel what it is we're feeling. And, you know, often people are feeling exactly what it would make sense to feel 
given that you're a person who's having the experience that you're having and that you have the history that you're having. In this room on a daily basis, I help people point out that the feeling that they're having makes sense. It makes sense that you're feeling sad, that you're losing your mom, uh, and that you're overwhelmed with emotions about that. It makes sad that you're angry because somebody in the workplace is treating you in an unfair manner. Um, we want to like not feel uncomfortable emotions. Um, and so we don't allow ourselves, we don't make space for and allow ourselves to feel that which is completely normal to feel. Um, that's one of the things about the happiness trap that I found so refreshing is that it really starts to, to help people realize that the full range of human emotions should be felt by every human. Like there's no emotion that any of us should not feel or be above feeling. Um, it's really about learning how to make space and not being ruled by our emotions. Um, and that's what we're going to try to talk about a little bit today. The vast majority of people are very busy trying to avoid experiencing emotions that are hard. Um, every day in my work, I meet people who don't want to be angry, don't want to feel sad, don't want to feel hurt, um, are trying not to feel vulnerable. That's a really big one. So they go out of their way to make sure that they don't ever feel that negative emotion. Perfectionism, for example, is really a very intense effort to avoid ever feeling shame. Um, so we try to make everything perfect so that we never have to feel um, that we've let somebody down or we've made a mistake. And it's not comfortable to feel those feelings, but the active effort of avoiding those actually can become an addiction in and of itself. Um, if you are a person that can't tolerate feeling loss, um, you will never let yourself be in a situation where something or someone means something to you. If you let something mean something to you, you're probably going to at some point experience loss. I hear that often from people like when they lose a pet, that they're not sure they want to have another pet because they don't know if they want to ever have to feel that loss again. Um, and they ultimately get to, then they also don't get to feel the love of having a pet again. So our, our desire to avoid difficult human emotions can cause us to have a really constricted life experience. Um, and so a lot of psychological suffering is caused by our effort to avoid a feeling. Um, avoiding, trying to avoid a certain feeling like anxiety can really be a barrier to you living the life that you are actually meant to live. Um, that's how it starts out. If people experience a car accident or they witness a car accident, they, they have some anxiety about driving, one of the ways they can avoid feeling anxious then is not to drive. And maybe at first it's, I'm not gonna drive on the highway, or I'm not gonna drive in this particular place, or I'm, you know, and, and pretty soon they're not driving at all. Like the effort to avoid anxiety from driving starts to limit their life. Um, and one of the most um, dramatic examples of that is people who feel anxious when they leave their home, and so they end up not even being able to leave their home. Um, that's a that's a big example, but we all do that on some scale when we when we have decided that there's emotions that we shouldn't be feeling. So if you were just to take a moment right now, grab a piece of paper and a pencil or something, and just write down quickly the emotions that you don't like having, the emotions that you try to avoid having, just jot them down. We're gonna to wanna to come back to that and look at that because there are probably things that you're doing that aren't healthy so that you don't have to feel those emotions. And um, I would like it to be, for there to be no emotion that you're not willing and able to have. Um, uh, not that you would wanna like go out of your way to feel rejected, for example, um, but if you're unwilling to feel rejected, you're never gonna use your voice. Um, you're never gonna like, speak your truth at a Thanksgiving table because someone in the room or a whole bunch of people in the room uh, might not agree with you and might shun you. Um, it's, it's really when we start to be willing to feel any emotion that we actually have the freedom to be value guided in our life. 
success is best measured by living a value guided life and being able to experience and metabolize and process whatever feelings naturally arise from your value guided life experience. I was listening to a TED talk by a woman named Kelly McGonigal, um, and it was really about um, how stress can be good for you sometimes, uh, which was a curious idea for me. In the, in the process, she says that um, uh, there's a research is indicating that the, the thought that stress is bad for you and the thought that you're having stress and therefore you're going to have a heart attack or something, the, actually research is showing that the thought that stress is bad um, is actually the, the indicator that would mean people would be more likely to have heart trouble and things like that. That um, having the stress is not necessarily an indication of a health concern. Um, and in the process, uh, she was asked the question, um, does that mean I should take a job that's stressful when I could take a job that's not stressful? And I loved her answer. She said, you should trust yourself enough to take the job that feels value guided and to trust that you're able to process the emotions that come up with it. Um, and that if you follow your value guided uh, directional quality um, and you're able to process emotions as they come up, that that would be the right way to go. That stress and struggle and challenges and rejection and uh, difficulty are all worthwhile and part of a rich and meaningful life if you get to live lined up with your values as opposed to not lining up with your values because it might be hard or difficult. So I really thought that was a, a worthwhile thing. We live in a culture that's a feel better culture. I mean, you got to know that. Like, so you have a headache, you take a pill. You, you feel anxious, you eat some sugary food. Um, you feel down and, and, uh, and uh, uh, in a low mood, uh, you go shopping and you spend some money. Um, I mean, the idea that we call that retail therapy um, is kind of like, this is how I'm going to help myself not feel or to feel better. And what my goal for you really is that you, instead of being, uh, feel better, you would just get better at feeling. I really believe that if uh, the critical mass of us were really good at dealing with difficult emotions, um, that uh, uh, our shared life experience would be so much more positive. Um, that uh, if we could feel anger and let it inform us and get clear about what, why we're angry, uh, we would be able to actually communicate that in a way that would be useful and helpful to positive change uh, in our personal lives and, and in our society life at a cultural level is what I meant to say. So again, expansion and acceptance, making space and allowing our emotions. Um, so what we're wanting you to do is in any given moment to be fully open to your present reality. Um, in this moment, you're feeling what you're feeling. Um, and just making space from that. It's actually just moving into a state of non-resistance. Um, this happens a lot with people who are grieving when, uh, because it's such an, a powerful emotion and in the moment it doesn't feel good. So people resist that they're grieving. And I hear all the time people say, I thought I was doing better, but I guess I'm not because they're judging themselves because they're having overwhelming feelings of grief. And I, I, I like somebody, I can't remember who it was, talks about those as grief bursts. Like you just mind your own business, something reminds you of the person you lost, and that emotion just like burst open in you. If you're in a state of non-resistance, you're just going to be able to acknowledge, I'm experiencing a grief storm, or I'm having a grief burst, and right now I'm having a really big emotion. And there's no problem with that. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to last forever. Uh, it's a big emotion, comma, right now. And if you meet it and greet it in a state of non-resistance, uh, interestingly enough, it goes away quicker when we don't. Because now if you're, if you're grieving and then you're resisting that you're grieving, you're actually constricting everything. You really want to relax into that moment of grief and say, wow, whew, I am just having a grief moment right now. And sometimes that includes flooding and sometimes tears and, and um, sometimes just a, a huge wave that kind of knocks you over. Um, and if you meet it and greet it and hold it, make space and allow, um, it's going to come up like a, like a tide wave and it's going to go back out. I mean, that's kind of how we want to actually be about our emotions is being fully open to them, allowing them and letting them go. Um, state of non-resistance. Uh, just acknowledging that 
the emotion we're having is just what the emotion we're having come of right now in this moment. In this moment, I'm really angry about what just happened to me. In this moment, I feel furious and I'd like to spit nails, but that doesn't seem very value guided. So I'm just going to make sure that I get to my, get myself to a space where I can allow myself to feel it and then release it. And what we do when we resist it is we hold it. And so all of that fury can be inside of us. And what we really want to do is be able to go some, I mean, we don't want to like, we don't want to ignore it and stuff it and resist it. We also don't want to get swept up and act out of it. So the kind of sweet spot in the middle is really that you're going to like acknowledge that you're furious right now, understanding that you have a good reason often to be furious. And you're just going to like go someplace where you can make some space for it, uh, honor it, allow it and release it. And, um, you know, what we want to do is physiologically even in release and express it. Um, uh, we want it to be moving through our body. We don't want to keep it stuck in our body. And um, one of the ways that, that uh, we release it is to do some physical expression of it um, in, in a given moment. And um, uh, all of that just as you allowing yourself to feel what you feel right now without regard to gender and the rules we have. Uh, women aren't supposed to feel anger. Uh, men aren't supposed to feel hurt. I think the world would be so much healthier if men were allowed to feel hurt and then to actually try to understand why they felt hurt. And then maybe they could have a, a different boundary or they could express what they need a little differently. Often men will have hurt and they'll hold it and stuff it and it actually just turns into anger and upset that way. Um, it's not helpful for us to have any emotions that we feel like we can't feel based on gender. Um, if women were able to feel their anger, um, express it for themselves, have an experience with it, let it inform them, then they would be better able to come and have a, a boundary um, uh, or uh, express what they need. Often it'll come out sideways because we, we haven't, honored it and released it. We're holding it and eventually it stockpiles up enough where we explode. Um, so often I'll have somebody in my office who has been in a situation where this feeling often comes up in this relationship. They don't say it, they don't say it, they don't say it, they don't say it. And then in a moment of upset, it all comes out in a way that actually gets them in trouble or causes them to act really out of alignment with their values. If we were tending to these emotions better as they come and go, that would be less likely to happen. Um, so we're just trying to like meet these emotions with pure awareness. Um, looking at it like with the neutral eye of a camera and just acknowledging what is. Um, uh, no judgment, no reaction, no jumping on that emotional train and riding it. We're just sort of making space for it right now. Um, this is also true for urges or um, sensations or um, pain is it's true like this like actually acknowledging and honoring a pain either physical or emotional can allow it to to dissipate some um, kind of greet the pain acknowledge it honor it images that we've had in our head memories that startle us a lot of times people end up with post-traumatic stress because um, they're trying really hard not to have any of those memories um, or they think they're wrong for having the memories, or they judge themselves because they have these images in their head. Um, what we want to do is acknowledge that, of course, given that we've had the experience that we've had, that we were in a robbery, or that um, uh, a friend of mine from way back was on a, a jury that had very, very vivid graphic images that the jurors had to look at. And these images were in her head, and for weeks afterwards, um, she was really bothered because she would have these images occur to her, particularly when she was sleeping or just waking up, so much that she wasn't even letting herself sleep, and then she got exhausted, and she was really fighting the fact that she was having these images. Um, and when I talked with her about it and sort of helped her see that, uh, you know, her parade of thoughts um, had been impacted by these images, that where she'd never had these images before, now because she had to be a juror, these images were in her head, and that that was 100% completely normal and natural for that to happen, um, and for them to be showing up in her dreams. And when she sort of said, so that's normal? I said, absolutely. 
I said, you, you just, you know, you're having them now, but you know, a, a month down the road, three months down the road, three years down the road, those are going to be gone and they'll be gone faster if you don't make a big deal out of the fact that you have them, of course you do. You just got bombarded with these images. And pretty quickly, she let me know that um, when she just would have them, she would just kind of, you know, acknowledge, of course, this is this got to work itself out. And just like any other healing, like, you know, right after surgery, you're more sore than you are three months later. Um, the same is true for emotions. So as her thought parade got populated with other things, um, those memories moved away. Now, I haven't talked to her in a number of years, but my guess is that those memories still come. Like sometimes she'll hear something on TV and those, Im those images will come back. And when they come back, they probably take her breath away just like they did when she first saw them because that's what thought does. It like gives us a physiological experience. Um, but it's okay when it does, it'll be okay if she just acknowledges, okay, I'm having a flashback from that experience. Let me just make space for it. It'll come and it'll go. Um, what we're looking for when we're having trauma like that is for the frequency, the duration, and the intensity of those thought experiences to dissipate over time. And one of the ways that happens is when we make space for and allow that they're there. Um, we don't want to be fighting them because, you know, what you resist persists. It can't process like it needs to if you're fighting it or trying to hold it back. Um, Russ Harris in one of his videos talks about um, holding an emotion back. Um, and like, it, if, if you were holding this emotion back all day, um, it, it would be hard to focus on other things because a lot of energy is going to holding this emotion back. We really want to just let it come and go. And notice that when we allow them, they will come and they will move on, particularly if we don't get our thought world all active with it. We're just letting ourselves feel, noticing it, making space for it, breathing into it, and then now what was I doing? Coming back to the present moment. We want to let them go without a struggle. The four steps of expansion to think about are um, uh, you want to observe your feelings and you just do a body scan when you're feeling a tight feeling. Sometimes I'm feeling my feeling right here. Sometimes it's in here. Sometimes it's in my shoulders. You just want to notice where, what am I feeling and where am I feeling it? And you want to figure out sometimes uh, with anger, sometimes it's like a, a knot or shame it's in my stomach area so you just want to notice that and then breathe into it um really take a deep breath and and i imagine like when i breathe in i'm breathing in all that emotion and when i exhale i'm just making space for it when breathing into them includes um uh trusting that the part of you that's bigger than the emotion you're having right now can handle it. Um, that emotions can be startling to us or overwhelming. Um, but somebody said to me once, her name was Mavis, she was a very good helper of mine. And she said to me once, Lisa, do you realize that when you're anxious, there's a bigger, deeper, broader, vaster part of you that's not. And that part of you, which now I know she was meaning like your observing self, or in her tradition, she would refer to that as mind or life energy, um, that that deeper part of me, my being, my essence, some would say soul, that part of me is holding my experience of anxiety. And that part can call me back home. When I get caught up with an emotion, often it shuts off my breath. And when I take a deep breath, Assume the position of a relaxed person. Now I'm a relaxed person who's angry instead of an angry person who's agitated. I'm a relaxed person who's angry, and now I can be kind of curious. What does this anger mean for me? Uh, what's it trying to tell me? Uh, what can I learn from it? Oh, what, what boundary is being violated? Is that boundary important enough for me to try to figure out how to do something about it? You observe your emotions and you breathe into them. And that's when you fall back into a more reflective space where you can really get a lot of uh, information. You want to create space for the emotion to be. Um, the part that Mavis was talking about, about my deeper, wiser self, Russ Harris's uh, quote that I really like is, knowing that that part of you, can, that observing self, can, can hold you, um, it's like an anchor in the midst of an emotional storm. 
It doesn't get rid of the storm, but it will hold you steady until it passes. Um, sitting with an emotion from that vantage point also reminds me that it's temporary, that I'm feeling it now, but I won't be feeling it always. And then I'm, and then I can handle it. Um, it's so um, affirming to me to know that there's really no emotion I'm not able to handle. Um, and at the age I'm at, I'm in my 50s, um, I've dealt with a lot of really difficult things. And um, really, uh, emotions are always a part of that. And if I think about it, and I list those emotions that I'm not, I'm not good at, really, it, that's actually a list of emotions I don't like to have. But if I've asked myself, have I ever had looked back at that list? Have you experienced all those emotions? My guess is yes, at some point in time you have, and you're still here to talk about it, which means you're capable of processing all those emotions. Um, and this is how you do it. You, make, you breathe into them, you make space for them, you remember that it's temporary, um, that it feels really big right now, but it's gonna not be forever. This is not your forever. I learned this from watching tearjerker movies. Um, you know when you're at a movie and it's really touching and it's like your throat gets tight and you know in that moment It can feel like you're going to be like that forever But really by the time you get to the car and then you're on your way home. It's not there anymore Emotions are like that they come in we have a physiological experience of them and then they dissipate We can help them by breathing into them and making space for them Hey everybody you might have noticed that that was kind of a an abrupt way to end the video uh, video six. Um, the conversation was actually a lot longer and we just decided to break it into two so that they would be shorter segments for you to take in. Um, so uh, when you go to episode seven, which is already done and ready, um, it'll go, it'll continue right where we left off and it'll go into some strategies for how best to make space for your emotions. So I want to thank Jonathan DeVello for helping me figure out how to do that and I hope you enjoy uh, episode seven. Take care.